Today I've got five bold predictions for the Green Bay Packers. Let's check it out. So for the more observable among you, you can probably tell I'm wearing the same ridiculous shirt again. Um, that's because I'm actually shooting these all same day. But I figured, you know what, let's, uh, let's swap out the silly hat. And I found this little number. It's still got the tags on it, so I thought I'd keep it fresh with the leave the tags on and whatnot. And uh, we'd go from there. If you are interested in the Green Bay Packers, please check out the Packernet podcast. You can find all that information to your left. Those are the places you can go to find the podcast. Um, please check it out. Otherwise, please, please, please subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell notification so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. First little comment before we get started. I did already talk about this on the podcast, so again, if you are um, interested in this, Please check out the podcast. But number one, first bold prediction. I believe by the end of 2020, Rashawn Gary will be playing more snaps than Preston Smith. Um, this is based on a couple different things. Obviously, the, the first thing that I am assuming is that Rashawn Gary takes a step. Um, again, in the podcast, I go a little bit more in depth, but his statistics were not actually that bad in terms of gross numbers. And I don't mean gross in terms of disgusting i mean total um there, there wasn't much there but he didn't play many snaps if you look at things in terms of percentages he was at 10 ish 11 ish percent pressure rate which isn't terrible um i think i oh, actually that's not true because um what i determined was that his pressures if you gave him the same amount of snaps as, as zadarius he would have been 14th i think in pressures and had like 12 sacks i forget his ranking but it would have been a good year if you just extrapolate it out um, the other really big thing pull is, is pulling from the other side, and that is the fact that I believe that the Packers want Rashawn to take over for Preston for salary cap reasons. They'd love to be able to have as every team would love to have as much as possible, but it's not feasible to pay everybody. And you got David Bakhtiari and Corey Lindsley and Kevin King and Aaron Jones, and all these guys want money. And, and on top of that, what's hastening all of this is the fact that the salary cap is dropping to 175 million which if you look at spot track they're saying we are 7 million under the cap if you look at ken ingles on uh, twitter i let's see he says we as of next year are almost 14 million over the cap is that what he says here projected to be almost 8 million over the cap i don't know how to read his thing i'll, I'll try to remember to put that up there for you to look at um but anyways um the salary cap is an issue, and if you look at Preston Smith, we're scheduled to pay him $16 million. The Packers would love to get out of that as much as is possible. Now, we have to pay the $8 million signing bonus. That's We can't get out of that. Um, that is uh, attributed to the cap, so we're going to eat eight of that. But we can free up uh, 16, and then in 2020, 16.5 is just washed clean. We're not paying any of that. The other slight bonus is the fact that Preston Smith is still a good football player. Um, meaning not only can we get rid of him, we could possibly trade him. If he gets double digit sacks for the second year in a row, we can get solid compensation for a guy like that. There are a lot of teams who would love to have Preston Smith. And I don't think he's getting double digit sacks, especially if we're pushing Rashawn Gary into that spot and giving him more snaps. But, but the other aspect of this is he doesn't even have to be as good as Preston to start taking over for Preston. Um, I just think that the fact of the matter is that's his spot, and they're going to give it to Rashawn as soon as they possibly can. And um, if he can even show up and be somewhat competent, um, I think they're going to. And, and, and there's also an element of I just think Rashawn is going to be pretty solid. We'll have to see. Anything's possible, but his his athleticism is out of control. And if he can just learn a couple couple things and get the mental side of it down, I think he's going to be a very good football player. Bold prediction numero due. Um, I believe, and it's hard to quantify better, but I believe, let's just say PFF grade-wise, Jace Sternberger will be second to Josiah DeGuara. Not in terms of snaps, I'm just talking about in terms of 
quality of play. I think Josiah DeGuara is going to have a better season. Now, Jace is probably going to have more snaps. He's probably going to have more yards because Jace is going to be the guy that takes Jimmy Graham's spot, who's going to be in the slot. He's going to be targeted more. He's going to be further down the field, all that stuff. The reason I'm saying this is just based on experience. Jace Sternberger spent one year at Texas A&M before coming here. He did not have a lot of opportunities here in Green Bay. So he's still completely raw coming into 2020, and there's no training camp. I mean, there's there's not much going on. There's there's no preseason, you know. So I still think he's going to potentially be a little bit raw. Now, he's going to be a little bit further ahead than DeGuara in terms of the specifics of the offense and everything else because Jace has been here. But I think DeGuara, first of all, he's a great fit. If you watch DeGuara, and I, I wasn't a big fan of his um, until after. He, he's one of the guys, the first three picks of the Packers, I didn't care for. But the more you watch him, you like. After that, I just I couldn't get on board with it. But the great thing about DeGuara is if you look at the offense that he came from in Cincinnati, it's very similar the motions and the, the kinds of plays, how everything kind of comes off the run. And it's similar kind of things where, you know, you don't know if he's going to block or if he's going to block and then slip out or, or whatever. Um, very, very similar. You know, the, the motion where you, you motion this way and run, run out for a route or then, you know, on the next play you run out this way and you're blocking very Lafleur esque And he's been there five years and he's played for five years he is extremely well versed in how to run this offense and how to do all the little nuances now he's still going to have a ways to go but i just think up here in terms of what he's being asked to do he's plug and play so i i, I really think from day one we're going to start seeing some stuff and to be honest it's simpler the th he's going to be in that h back role where he's going to be more of a tricky kind of guy so a lot of his stuff is going to be schemed open Whereas Sternberger in the slot is probably going to have to do a little bit more one-on-one -on -one relying on his athleticism. He, I think he has a harder job. He's less experienced. And um, although I am extremely excited about Jace and the potential, and I like the duo, and I really hope it takes off, I think DeGuara is going to, to really impress some people. And I genuinely believe by the end of the year he will have a higher pro football focus grade. That is the way I'm going to measure better. Bold prediction number three, I believe A.J. Dillon has more carries than Aaron Jones. Now, do I think he's going to be a better football player? Not necessarily. I am excited about A.J. Dillon, but Aaron Jones is already one of the best running backs in the league. But here's my thought process behind this. Um, you know, one of the things that people seem to forget is this whole Derrick Henry explosion really started with uh, Matt LaFleur when he got there and he decided that he wanted a big, bulky workhorse back, and he just handed the keys over to um, to Derrick Henry. I think with this system, which makes a lot of sense, you need and want sort of a workhorse back. That's what he wants. And I, I, well, I'm not going to say McCarthy wanted it too because he probably didn't, but um, the fact of the matter is, as much as you would love to have a guy like Aaron Jones be your workhorse back, he's just not built that way. It's just not physically possible to give the man 18, 19 carries in a game. I mean, occasionally. He has some under his belt. But to do something like that consistently is a is a, a tall order. And, and you want to preserve a guy like Aaron Jones. And, and I think that's what A.J. Dillon's going to be able to do. Um, and so with... A.J. Dillon being the workhorse back, the grind down the defense kind of guy, and, and obviously this depends on his abilities. If he's not a good running back, this isn't going to happen. So part of the bold prediction is that he's going to be um, a good running back, and I think he will be. I, I think he did a great job over there at Boston College. He faced stacked boxes way more than anybody else. And when you on a rare occasion where you saw a hole, he just absolutely destroyed. He saw it. He used quick cuts right through the hole, and he's flying. He's faster than Aaron Jones is despite his size. So I think he's going to be fine. And I think Matt LaFleur's intention is to use him like a workhorse back. And as a result, he'll have more carries. I think Aaron Jones is still going to have a great impact. He's going to run the ball a lot. Um, it'll be similar to back in the day when it's like, why don't we give you know, when Jamal and Aaron Jones were splitting carries evenly under Mike McCarthy and everybody was frustrated, frustrated by that. But I think maybe to a lesser degree because I think people are going to be excited about uh, about Dylan. But um, that may be a source of, of frustration. And, and the other really negative thing, even if we utilize him in a more specialized way and, and because he's fresh, he's, he's even better and we're using him more as a receiver, which would be great out of the backfield and all that stuff. 
the really unfortunate aspect about it, again, looking at the contract and, and just the fact that you don't generally want to pay running backs and whatnot, um, I think it makes it even less likely, again, with the salary cap coming down and, and Dylan taking over, that we end up paying Aaron Jones. Because Aaron Jones is worth a lot of money. Hello, alarm clock. And um, it's one of the staples of the podcast, by the way, having alarm clocks go off. Um, I don't remember where I was. So, uh, TV, camera, man, woman, something like that. I don't know. I failed. Um, but, but Aaron Jones is probably going to be on the way out. As much as it hurts to say that, I think that's the way it is. But anyways, the bold prediction, A.J. Dillon has more carries, not a better running back, has more carries by the end of the season than Aaron Jones. Bold prediction number four, Darnell Savage is the breakout player of the year. Um, now, a couple objections that people may have. Number one, you just did a um, who's going to be the next Devontae breakout player video, and he didn't even make the list. How is this possible? Simple. The question for the Devontae thing was about who's a guy that hasn't been performing that's about to break out, a guy that we've kind of given up on. Darnell wasn't an elite player, but he was good. He was, he was solid. He was fine. Second objection might be, uh, what about Rashawn? I thought he was taking that spot. I'm not quite going as far as breakout for Rashawn. I think he takes a step. I think he takes enough of a step that the Packers take a risk and say we're going to move on from Preston in the hopes that he continues to progress. Um, It's possible that Rashawn breaks out, but I'm not necessarily predicting that. I am saying, however, that of all the guys on this team, the one that I think has the highest probability of being a superstar in 2020 that we we didn't know about, I'm not talking Devontae and Rodgers and those guys, a guy that wasn't but will be, is Darnell Savage. He's got all the tools. He had a great first year, which is a rare thing. Rookies across the league, across time, don't generally do very well. Elton Jenkins, obviously, is another one that did a fantastic job. But Darnell Savage came out, and he did a fine job. Um, on top of that, he's got Amos to learn from, who's a great veteran presence that does a great job. And we brought in, and I'm going to forget his name, and I apologize, the DB coach from Minnesota, who has coached some of the best safeties in football. It seems like every guy that comes in there is a freak of a safety. So I'm hoping a little bit of that magic mixed with Amos, mixed with Petten, who is a d- good defensive coordinator. He's got to you know kind of step it up a little bit, but... All these things combined, when you look at Darnell Savage and the fact that he's clearly not a bust, we know that, right? Some guys just aren't good. So you take the fact that he is a good player, he's going into his second year, he's got tools that are extremely rare. His, his ranginess is ridiculous. You've got the coaching, you've got all this stuff rolled up into the perfect little package that says to me, I think he's going to be a special football player. And finally, bold prediction number five. I believe Aaron Rodgers has his best year since 2014. And again, I'm using PFF as my metric. And why am I using that instead of stats? I don't know that necessarily he's going to have the best year statistically. If you look at some of the years here, I got the wrong thing up. Um, He's had some great years. You're looking at 2016, 5,400 yards, 49 touchdowns, 9 interceptions. I'm not going to predict he beats that ever for the rest of his career. Now, by the way, this is really the year that he has to beat. If you look at his PFF grade in 2014, the year that I'm saying he won't necessarily beat is a 93.4. Since then, 75, 2015 was a terrible year, 91.4, which is his best year in that range that he's going to have to beat in order for my prediction to be correct. 2017, 79.2, that was his injury year. 2018, the the disaster under McCarthy, he was still given an 89 overall grade, which is borderline elite. And then in 2019, 83.6, clearly somewhat of a down year, but still a pretty good year. But you factor in, I, I, I and I've been saying this on the podcast, I think that year two is when the Matt LaFleur scheme takes hold. We saw glimmers of it, but it was still largely the old Mike McCarthy drop back, air it out. I've mentioned several times on the podcast about how Aaron Rodgers' number one route is a go route, and and just how it's it's still the same old backyard football where he drops back. There's a guy open, but I want the one deep down there, and I'm gonna wait for it and wait for it, and it's not there, so now I'm gonna scramble and oh, who's out there? Except I don't have Jordy, and I don't have Cobb, and I don't have all these guys that are there that are usually there when things break down to bail me out. So then I throw it away. I think Matt Lafleur talked. I know that he talked about melding the two systems. 
I think this year Matt LaFleur needs to take this team by the reins, and I think he will, and say, look, this is my team. I respect what you guys did here in Green Bay, but we're going to start doing it my way, and you're going to start seeing a lot more running the football, which doesn't necessarily help Aaron Rodgers, but running the football and then building off of that a lot shorter passes you look at drew Brees and his ridiculous accuracy which he's always been very accurate his completion percentage and all that what and stuff but he's also now one of the quickest to get the ball out of his hand that helps tremendously for any quarterback with the exception of kirk cousins who somehow balanced accuracy and and waiting forever to throw the ball but um aaron Rodgers also is one of the slowest to get the ball out of his hand and um also by the way little side note if you want to know how quickly um, Matt LaFleur wants to get the ball out of his hand look at Jordan Love and how quickly he got the ball out of his hand if he did what he did in college in the pros he would have gotten the ball out quicker than anybody in in all of football that is the goal and with that comes easier passes and and timing type things so we're we're not just talking about little dump offs for the sake of dump offs but but timing and rhythm and getting guys open based on scheme and using your tight ends and misdirection and all this kind of stuff. And, and if Aaron Rodgers can tap into that and tie into that, and, and Matt LaFleur has to do his part as well as far as making sure that he's calling the right plays at the right time and that these guys are actually getting schemed open because with Devontae, with Lazard, with Funches, with Sternberger, with Aaron Jones and with uh, DeGuara and all that, there's enough talent there that if, if you call the right play at the right time, they, they can make it work, right? You're attacking the soft spot. You're doing this and that and the other thing to catch guys off guard, especially manipulating linebackers with, with them trying to decide on every play, is this a run or is this a pass? And every play looks like a run. And if you don't commit, A.J. Dillon destroys you. And if you do commit, somebody's going to beat you from behind. Point is... Um, I think Aaron Jones, Aaron Rodgers, if he can tap into it, is going to have a fantastic year. And again, my prediction will be his best year since 2014, which means he needs to do better than a 91.4 overall pro football focus grade. And I think he will.